Amen. Well, thank you, worship team. Man, I love singing about that. <laughs> that is our living hope, Jesus Christ. So, hey, if you have your Bibles, open up to Psalm 51. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 51 this morning. And so, as you can see on the screen, we're continuing our cassette tape series. Um, <laughs> so, we're, con- we're continuing our series called The Songs We Sing. And so, we are looking at different psalms over the summer. And what we're looking at in each psalm is a different type of of human emotion. So we know that our God is a personal God, and He has emotion Himself. And we are created in His image, which means that now, as His image bearers, we have the capability and the capacity to express emotion. But as sinful creatures, we don't always express that emotion very well. We struggle. Some of us bottle up our emotions inside and never try to let anybody know how we really feel. Some of us are the complete opposite on that spectrum. We uh, wear our emotions on our sleeve, and you can tell exactly how we feel just by looking at our face, right? But wherever you land on that spectrum of how visible or not your emotion may be, the Psalms are a guide and a help to us because they instruct us, they teach us how to deal with our emotions as humans created in the image of God properly. So today we're looking at Psalm 51 and looking at the emotion of remorse. All right. Well, let me pray for us before we dig in, and we'll see what God's Word has to say for us today. So would you pray with me? Jesus, again, we're so thankful for our freedom. We're thankful that we get to worship you today. Lord, we're thankful that we have opportunities to exercise the freedom of sharing your good news. Would we do that Would we be saturated by your word and your gospel today? Lord, I pray that you would specifically use Psalm 51 to speak to our hearts this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He was a well-respected man in the community. He loved God. He was a great leader to many. But he let his mind and his thoughts wander in directions they shouldn't go. He let his eyes wander in places they shouldn't be. He let his heart wander. And when confronted with temptation to sin, he gave in. He did the unthinkable. He had an affair with a married woman. He, after a short time, passes the the woman, tells him that she's pregnant. And she knows he's the father because her husband is off fighting a war in the military. So he panics. He doesn't know what to do. And instead of coming clean, he tries to cover up. The whole situation. He devises a plan to cover the whole thing up. And and he does the unthinkable again. He devises a plan to have the husband of this woman killed while at war. And it works. And he thinks he's okay now. He thinks that his sinister plot has worked. He thinks he's covered his tracks. And so he marries the now widow and she gives birth to his son. Now this story may sound like something off of Dateline or it may sound like a Lifetime movie, which I've never watched, by the way, and don't plan on it. But this story is actually from your Bible. And it's found in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. It's the story of King David, the greatest king of Israel. A man described in the scriptures as a man after God's own heart. Yet he fell and committed these grievous sins. He was the leader of Israel. He had an affair with a woman named Bathsheba, and he had her husband, Uriah, murdered. 
Now, as interesting as this story is, it's not the point of the sermon today, but it is the backdrop of the song that David wrote in Psalm 51. If you notice in your Bible, many of you in, in your Bibles, if you look down, you'll see there's an introduction statement written at the beginning or at the top of Psalm 51, and it's telling you why this song was written. You see, this is a song that David wrote that expresses how he felt and what he did after he realized how terrible and wicked his actions actually were. In, in my Bible, it says this, that this is a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. You see, there was a man named Nathan, he was a prophet in Israel, who confronted David about this heinous crime. And so this song that David later wrote gives us an extraordinary look an insight into David's heart and the remorse he felt after being confronted about his sin. You know, I think this is a song we can all relate to. I think all of us sing this song from time to time. When we realize something we have done that has hurt others and it's hurt God, when we realize our sin, we will have this sense of remorse in us. And so the question we're asking today, though, is how do we properly deal with that remorse? Well, b before we answer that specifically, I, I need to tell you, first of all, that the Bible talks about two different kinds of remorse. You see, the first is what you would call a worldly remorse or a worldly grief. Now, man, some of you, when you're growing up, maybe your mom used to say to you after you did something wrong, now listen, are, are you sorry you did it or are you sorry you got caught? Uh, both, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you see, that's that kind of worldly kind of remorse where we fear our consequences Right? We're scared of what might happen if we get caught more than we're afraid of the actual power of the sin inside our heart. As the ESV Study Bible puts it, this world remorse, it's a remorse brought about by losing the world's approval. And it leads to a resolve to regain that approval somehow. So in other words, when we do get caught... When we do something wrong and other people know about it, if you feel really guilty and really shameful and you feel really bad about it, the question is, what is the real reason I'm feeling this guilt and this shame and this remorse over what I've done? Is it because I have lost the approval of others and now I must do anything to try to prove to them over time that they can trust me again or that they need to accept me or whatever? And so I'm going to try really hard now to be a really good person, and I'm going to go to church. Man, I'm going to go to church on Sunday mornings. I'm even going to go on Wednesday nights just to prove to God, man, look how much I really love you. You see, that, that's a worldly kind of remorse where you've done something wrong, and now you are trying to dig your way out of it by proving to the world and anyone else that you're not that bad of a person. But where's God in that picture? But there's another kind of remorse the Bible talks about. Listen to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, Paul says this. He says, As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Now thankfully, David's remorse or his grief here is the proper kind. It's how we should feel after we've sinned and after we've done something wrong. David's remorse is, is prompted by his realization that he has sinned against God, that God is displeased with him, that he's not walking in that intimate fellowship with his creator as he's designed to do. That's what's gnawing at David more than anything. 
But see, this grief, this remorse, it's godly because it's good because it leads to repentance. It leads to us turning back to God and seeking that intimate fellowship with Him again. And so this song, this psalm, will instruct us how to deal with our deep regrets that we have from things we've done in our past. And more than anything today, my hope for you is that as we just sang these songs about Christ and the freedom we have, my hope for you is that you will feel that freedom today, the freedom of forgiveness as you leave this place, no matter what you've done and what's eating at your conscience. You ready? Let's do it. Psalm 51, how do we properly deal with our remorse? The first thing is this, we're gonna see in verses one and two. We must approach God and ask him for forgiveness. We must approach God and ask him for forgiveness. Look at verse one and two. Have mercy on me, O God, David says. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You know, I think many of us, when we realize we've done something wrong, when we realize we've sinned, we are afraid to go to God in prayer. Often, our, the first place our mind goes is what? Consequences, right? What's going to happen if someone finds out I did this? Or what's going to happen now because I have been caught? Or who am I going to have to try to reconcile with? We immediately start thinking on those horizontal levels and the last place we end up going is in prayer to God. Now, we should think about some of those things. I'm not, we're going we're gonna to see that in a minute. But many of us are afraid to come to God when we sin. We feel unworthy, right? We, we feel guilty. We feel shameful. We think in our minds and our flesh starts telling us, God doesn't want to talk to you. God doesn't want anything to do with you. Look at how you've been living. Look at what you've done. See, Satan is called the great accuser in the scriptures. And he accuses your conscience. He accuses your life, your soul, your heart all the time. He wants you to believe that God doesn't want you to come to him when you do something wrong. That God is angry and mad and does not even want to talk to you. But David isn't afraid. Our God is approachable. He is personal. And so David asked boldly for God to blot out his sinful actions as if they never happened. He approaches God and asks God not just to blot out his record and to clear the debt, but to cleanse him and make him clean again, to renew his sinful character and his heart. That's kind of asking a lot. Right? I mean, we're, you, you come to God, you approach Him, and you say, hey, can you just make it so that basically none of this ever happened? At least legally standing in terms of the debt that I'm in because of my sin? That's asking a lot. But you know what? We can approach a holy God. The great judge, God the Father, we can approach Him and we can ask Him boldly for these things. Why? Hear the words, from Hebrews 4. Here's why. Listen to this. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are Yet, without sin. Jesus came to this earth and lived a perfect life as he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, as he was tempted by his family members who called him crazy, as he was tempted by the religious leaders who told him he was a sinner, as he was tempted by the secular world who thought he had lost his mind and wanted him to give in to all the temptations. Jesus lived a perfect life without any sin. Why? Because he knew that we couldn't. He knew that you couldn't. And so he came to earth and lived it for you in your place as your substitute. And so look at verse 16. Here's what we get then. 
Here's what you get when you put your faith in Christ. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Confidence. You get to go to the creator God and judge of all things good and evil boldly with confidence to his throne and ask him for forgiveness because Jesus stands in your place. Our God is approachable because through Christ he approached you. Do you see that? It's not like he was just twiddling his thumbs, sitting on his throne in heaven, waiting for you to come to him. He came to you. He came down from heaven to you. So he could be victorious over sin and death as he experienced every type of temptation we go through. He succeeded where we failed. And he did that for us in our place, his record for ours. So we can approach God's throne with confidence and be assured that is exactly what God wants you to do. When you fall into some kind of temptation or sin, the first place you need to turn is to God, not to run further from him. He doesn't want you to run away. He doesn't want you to conceal it. He doesn't want you to try to hide in guilt and shame. He is waiting for you to run to him and ask for the mercy he's already got for you. He wants you. But what else? What else should we say to him when we approach him as David did in verse 1 and 2? Well, the second thing we see in this psalm is this. We must acknowledge the depth of our sin. So here's the thing. We approach God with boldness and confidence. We ask him for forgiveness. But as we're talking to him and confessing our sins to him, we need to be honest with him and with ourselves about how serious that sin is. The first thing we realize, and we must admit, is that it's my sin, right? I got to own up to this. It's, it's my sin. Listen to David's words in Psalm 51, verse 3. He says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. You see how he acknowledges his sin and owns up to it, right? He's not blaming anybody else. He's saying, oh, I know, this is my fault. I'm the one who did this. I'm the one who slept with the married woman. I'm the one who had her husband killed. It's me. I'm not blaming my condition or my surroundings or my context or the other people who were pressuring me and I was stressed and it was a hard time in life and it was a dark season. No, 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 no. I am guilty. This is a sign of that godly type of grief or remorse that we saw. This is true repentance. Owning up to your sin and admitting that it was you. That is what we see here. As hard as it is, that's what David's doing. But notice that he says this sin, it's ever before me, he says in verse 3. In other words, it's always on his mind. Oh man, he just can't shake it. That, that what he did. I mean, he, he's, there's triggers that, that put these thoughts in his mind and it takes him back to what he did and he hates it and he doesn't even want to think about it. But there it is. Like a record player that he can't get out of his head, these thoughts and these images are playing over and over again in his mind. Can anybody relate? the things we're ashamed of that we've done in our past, and you see it in your head. Listen to this other song that David wrote. He he wrote another song about the same situation, but he described his deep regret even clearer in Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. He said, For when I kept silent, in other words, when I didn't confess my sin to God, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. David's anxiety over his sin was affecting him physically. You see, this is someone who is tormented by regretting their past. How do we relieve that feeling? 
How, how do we relieve this feeling? Not, not only do we own up to this sin and say, it was me, that's where you start. But the second thing under this point you have to realize is that it offends God. You have to be reconciled to God in order to be alleviated from this feeling of guilt. It offends God. Our sin offends God. Look what David says next in verse 4. He says, against you. He's talking to God. He's singing to God. Against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Of course, David sinned against other people, obviously, very grievously. But this, this is a poetic expression, and, and it signifies that his highest offense, his highest offense is against his creator God, the judge of all things, good and evil, whom he will stand before one day and answer for his life. David understands the first and highest offense is against God. Now hear me out. Hear me out. We should absolutely be concerned with how our sin affects other people. Absolutely. We should be concerned about how our mistakes and our problems have made other people feel. And we should seek to reconcile with them. Don't miss that. But don't miss this either. If you want to move past your past, if you want to accept God's forgiveness, and if you want to forgive yourself, which many of us struggle with, just forgiving ourselves, then you must realize that your sin is first and foremost a sin against God. Because if you spend, listen to this, if you spend your whole life trying to earn back the trust and approval of those whom have been hurt by your sin. If, if that's your main objective, I'm not, obviously we should reconcile with the people we've hurt, yes. But if that is your main objective and not so much reconciled with God, you may or may not succeed at that. You may or may not succeed, but when you stand before the throne of God on judgment day, it is His approval that will count for eternity. Some of us have, a, have trouble forgiving ourselves. You know why? Because we have elevated ourselves above God as the ultimate judge. The reason some of you can't get past your past is because God has forgiven you. But you think that your opinion counts more than God's. And so you have elevated yourself in actual pride over God himself. When in all reality, he is looking at you and saying, yes, you offended me, but I died for you. And your debt is clear. Listen to this, though. D David keeps going in this song. He goes deeper here. And the third thing we see under this point not only must we own up to our sin, not only must we realize that it offends God, but here's what else you got to realize. We are sinful to our core. It's not just that we sinned. We don't just need to confess our sin. We need to confess our sinfulness. Look what David says in verses 5 and 6. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, he was sinful in his nature from the start. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. You see, we must not only acknowledge our sinful actions we've committed. The greater issue is that we are sinful creatures. We have a sinful nature that we have inherited from Adam, our first father, way back to the Garden of Eden. And we must acknowledge and confess how far from the truth we actually are without Christ. You see, ironically, our sin actually blinds us to our depravity and convinces us often that we are not so bad, right? And so what do we do? We look for ways to justify to ourselves, to God, and to others we've hurt that maybe we're not so bad. 
It's like when my four-year-old son pretends to be a pirate and hits his siblings upside the head with the foam pirate sword. And I ask him, son, why did you hit your brother? I'm a pirate. What else do you expect, right? Well, uh, let's talk, right? But, but you know what's funny? That, that pattern of convincing ourselves that for whatever reason our actions are justified, that pattern flows out of our childhood right into our adulthood, doesn't it? Why did you do that, man? Listen, I, you don't understand, okay? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a businessman, and I've got all this stuff going on, all right? And I'm stressed, okay? Man, we do that, don't we? We, we love to create narratives in our heads about ourselves that justify our actions. You see, that's so dangerous because that's what sin does to you. It, it, it blinds you. But do you see in verse 5 and 6 what David is saying? He has been awakened to the reality and depth of his problem. It goes all the way down to the deepest parts of his heart and his soul. It was inherited in his conception because humankind in general, all humans, are sinful to our core. There's nothing we can do to escape this problem, that we've been separated from our Creator because we've rebelled against Him. So it's only natural, I'm sorry, it's only when we live in and believe God's truth do we accurately see ourselves for who we really are. The greatest self-help books and psychology today cannot reveal to you your truest, most inner self like the Word of God can. If you want to know why you are the way you are and why you do the things you do, you must open your heart to the Word of God and let Him reveal these things to you. My sin was telling me lies about my condition, David says. But through God's Word and the Holy Spirit, now I have a true understanding of myself. You see, we have to have this humble spirit and attitude if we're ever going to get past our past. If we're ever going to let God's transformative grace do its work in our hearts. The third big thing we see in this psalm is this. We must embrace the process of renewal. We must embrace the process of renewal. You know, here, here's something we know to be true in life. Often the greatest rewards in life, they come after painful yet necessary processes, right? That, that they come to us after painful yet necessary processes. So think about the reward of the birth of a child. That comes after a pretty painful process, so I've been told, right? The reward of, of living sober after a rigorous recovery program, man, that reward is great, but that process can be painful. The reward of learning to walk again physically after an injury and a challenging physical therapy, man, that reward is great, but it comes at a cost. You see, in verses 7 through 12, David is asking God. Don't miss this. David is asking God to do a spiritual heart surgery on him. He knows that's what he needs. So that one day, he can truly experience the joy and the gladness that he used to feel. That has left him. Because his sin has numbed him. And joy and happiness seems elusive. But look at what he says in Psalm 51, 7 through 9. He says, purge me with hyssop. That was a, a, cleaning, uh, a, a cleaning natural herb thing they used. And, and he says, purge me with, with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. What is David asking for? David is asking God to rid him of any and every sinful desire that remains. 
David doesn't want to just give half of his heart to God. David says, I'm done with sin. I'm done with this. I'm done with this addictive behavior. I'm done with this choice to live this way or this life. I want to give all of me to you. And that's exactly what he says. He wants more of God in his life and less of sin. But this comes with a warning, a fair warning. Beware that when you ask God, when you approach him and ask him for forgiveness and you acknowledge the depth of your sin and you ask him to renew you, it's probably going to hurt. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is probably going to break you. But in His great mercy and in His great forgiveness, God will use your brokenness to work His renewal of your inner self. It's going to be painful. It's going to be painful because the Holy Spirit is going to reveal things deep inside of you that you didn't even know were there. You know, some of our sins that we struggle with are really just on the surface of who we are. So some of our behaviors and things we do, losing our temper with our spouse, being angry, being a little shady with how we're doing our finances, whatever it may be, all of those things are just surface level symptoms of a greater problem deep in your heart. And when you come to the Lord and ask Him to rid your heart, like David did, of all the sin inside me, the Holy Spirit is going to start pointing out really deep issues inside of you, and you're not going to like it. I'm going to tell you that right now. He's done it in me, and He continues to do it in me. He's going to do it in you when you ask. He's revealing deep idols deep inside your heart that are really the cause of those symptomatic behaviors. So maybe you need the approval of others. You worship the approval of others. And that's why you're doing the things you're doing. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal that problem to you. And he's going to change you, but it's going to be a process. Look what David says in verse 10. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is all internal here, right? This isn't even talking about external behaviors. This is internal issues in his heart. If you are dealing with deep regret and remorse unnecessarily over your past sins today, here's what you need to believe and embrace. That God, the God who created the universe out of nothing, the God who spoke and planets came into existence, by His Word, He can create something in your wicked heart. Absolutely, He can. He could create something beautiful inside of you by speaking his truth into the dark places of your heart that you've been trying to hide for years. I believe that with my whole heart, that God will and can do that in your life. He is a God of new beginnings. Our God, his mercies are new every morning. He creates, that's what he does. Our God creates life. And he can transform your mess. If you walked in here this morning and the truth is there's parts of your heart, there's parts of your life that are just a mess, I want you to know and I want you to be assured that God can transform your mess into something beautiful. He is not finished with you. He loves you. He can create in you a clean heart. He can renew a right spirit within you. Our kids for VBS here at Kernan last week. We had over 140 kids here, and you know what the theme verse for VBS was this year? Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. If you know the Lord and you still have messed up in some way, I want you to know that when you acknowledge your sin, you own up to it, you come to Him, you ask for forgiveness, you plead with Him for mercy, and He starts this process of renewal in you, that He will work on you until you are complete. And that's going to be the day that you enter into eternity. If you truly know the Lord this morning, Know that he will continue to work to renew your heart. 
But it's going to be a process, and we have to be patient. It's going to be painful at times because you're going to have to face your greatest fears head on. As you have to have hard conversations in order for reconciliation to take place. As you have to admit your character flaws. After you have to turn, after you have to turn away from the worldly pleasures and temptations you used to give in to. But look at verse 11 and 12. David continues. He tells us that you're not alone and that real joy can be yours again. Look what he says. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. I think some of you just need to cry out to God today for Him to restore the joy of just knowing Him. And just being known by Him. Some of you need to cry out to God today and say, Lord, just help me and restore the joy in my heart of knowing that I'm Yours. That You are enough for me. And that You will keep me from falling back into that problem, that mess, that sin. See, where we once thought that a particular sin was where we found joy now Christ is our joy. And it's only when we really believe that, it's only when Christ is our greatest treasure that we will run from sin and live in obedience. Because you know what else? That, that's true renewal. We, we must embrace that process because I, I don't think God's done with you. I really don't. I don't think anybody in here is messed up so bad that God cannot change their life and use you for His glory. You know what? That brings us to the last point we see in Psalm 51. We must tell others the good news. We must tell others of how Christ has changed us. And we're not perfect. We still struggle. We still mess up. But we live under His grace and His forgiveness and we seek to live in obedience to Him. Listen to this, Psalm 51, verse 13. David says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. You see, David was in a position of great authority, both spiritually and politically, when he fell. But this shows that God is not discontinuing his ministry. David says, Once I confess my sin and you renew me from the inside out, then... I can teach other people about your grace and I can lead them to your throne. But a clean and repentant heart is necessary to do that. Look at what he says, verse 14 and 15. He says, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Man, do you see how the tone of this whole song is changing? It started out with David just admitting how he used to, his song, his song in life used to be self-serving. And he was only concerned about himself. And then his song in life switched to remorse and guilt and shame. But now his song is turning into praise. You know, let's keep reading. Verse 16 and 17. He says, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Part of our vision statement here at Kernan is that we would become a people who worship with authenticity. Worship with authenticity. This is that. What David is saying here is exactly that. It's the praise of the heart that God is after. And that is characterized by a life of integrity and obedience, not hypocritical religious show or facade. God is not interested in seeing or watching you try to dig yourself out of the hole that you dug. He is not interested of you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, so to speak. He doesn't want you to try to alleviate your guilt and shame by trying harder or beating yourself up and inflicting judgment on yourself constantly. 
Here's what you need, and here's what a watching world needs to see in our lives. You ready for this? The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to move past your past. It's the only way to experience the freedom of forgiveness. Being broken over your sin, as David says, is the only way. Turning to Christ and his payment of forgiveness and his cleansing power. That means we must accept the legal debt removal and the implications, the practical implications of that, that we are free to move on. We don't have time and we cannot afford to wallow in self-pity and pride and regret and remorse while the world around us is drowning. We don't have time for that. Listen to what David says in verse 18 and 19 as he concludes his song. He says, do good to Zion and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. You see now how David, after experiencing God's forgiveness, what, what's happening? He's becoming others focused. You see that? He's not even talking about himself anymore. He's talking about how he wants good to come to his community and his city. He wants the people of his city to see the light of Christ. Sin keeps you fixated on yourself, and that's exactly what Satan wants. But here we see David now wants his people to worship with authenticity, like he is now doing in his own life. The praise in your heart that comes from the process of God renewing you, you see, that can now be communicated to the others around you. So as we close, here's, what I, here's my question to you. What is holding you back today? What regret has your heart captive today? What's stopping you from telling the good news of Jesus' forgiveness with others? Is it perhaps that you yourself, though you are a child of God, you're treading water unnecessarily in your own remorse. I encourage you today to do exactly what David did, to approach, approach your loving Father God and confess your sin. Ask Him to forgive you. Be honest about your sin and ask Him to create in you a clean heart to renew you from the inside out and to restore the joy of your salvation. Ask him to give you the motivation to share that good hope and that good news with someone else who desperately needs to hear it, just like you did when you walked in here today. I think our song moving forward needs to be not remorse but the power and the freedom of God's forgiveness. It is yours today for the taking. Our band's gonna come up and lead us and they're gonna sing Psalm 51. And as they come up, I wanna pray. But as I pray, I want you to pray. And maybe this needs to be the spark that sets off the flame where you approach God and you fall to your knees and say, Lord, have mercy on me, O God. I am a sinner. But I believe that Jesus was the sacrifice I needed. The only sacrifice. And that without Him, I am nothing. Lord, I need You. Would You grant me the freedom of forgiveness? Would You make that Your prayer today? Jesus, we love You. And we're so thankful we're thankful for the fact that you approached us, that you came down to us. We can never work our way to you. We may be trying to prove to others that we're okay or that we're a good person or that they can trust us. We may be trying to prove that to ourselves. We may be trying to prove that to you. 
But Lord, You know our hearts. And because You know our hearts and how sinful they are, God, You came down to us. You lived the life that we can't live. You lived it for us. You died the death we should have died in our place. And You rose from the grave to give us the power and the freedom of forgiveness. Lord, may no one in here leave this place with a heavy heart. Lord, I pray that You would break the chains off of anyone who is drowning in regret and remorse. Lord, I pray that that would lead them to repentance today. That You would grant forgiveness and grace. That You would transform our lives. So that we may become others focused. So that we can look at this world and say, look at the grace that is yours for the taking. Look at the hope you can have and the forgiveness you can experience. Jesus, do this great work in us. May we cry out to you now in song. It's in your name we pray. brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me behold you delight in the truth and the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart Sin is not far but right in front of me Against you and you alone, God, I am guilty Wash me thoroughly and cleanse me from iniquity And teach me wisdom in a secret heart Create in me a clean heart salvation and teach me wisdom in the secret heart send me the chief of sinners to proclaim come be forgiven of sin the lamb of god was slain Open my lips and my mouth will declare your endless praise And teach me wisdom in the secret heart Create in me a clean heart, O oh God And renew a right spirit within me, O oh God your Holy Spirit, restore to me the joy of your salvation, and teach me wisdom in the secret heart. The Lord is gracious and slow to anger in love he is good to all the lord is gracious and slow to anger rich in love he is good to all the lord is gracious and Create in me a clean 
sunshine and teach me wisdom in the secret heart.